happens if someone is found guilty of murder. Murder is a rare crime, with an instance rate in Australia of only 1.1 per 100,000 people in the 2011 to 2012 period. However, when it does occur, in all states and territories in Australia, as in many other places, this offence typically carries a lengthy jail term. For convicted offenders, imprisonment is the severest form of punishment available in Australia, as the death penalty was finally abolished in this country in the mid-1980s, when in 1984 Western Australia removed it for all crimes, and in 1985 when New South Wales removed death as a possible punishment for treason, piracy and associated offences. Now, an analysis of sentences handed down in Victoria for 2007 to 2008 through to 2011 and 2012 for the 119 people sentenced to imprisonment for murder found that the most common combination of imprisonment length and non-parole period imposed was a life sentence with a non-parole period of 25 years or more. Now, the length of imprisonment ranged from 10 years, 6 months with a non-parole period of 6 years to life with no non-parole period. However, prison is increasingly a punishment that is dealt out to offenders who commit other crimes. So there has been a dramatic rise in the number of people being sent to jail that does not match the rise seen in the amount of crime committed or detected. Coyle in 2013 notes that the number of people in prison in the US has gone from one half of a million to over two million in 20 years. And in England and Wales, the prison population has risen in the last 14 years from 45 to 75,000. The same pattern is generally evident in Australia, where the rate per 100,000 adult population was 185.6 in 2014, which was up from 158.8 in 2004. So what will imprisonment do to this increasing number of people? Now this is what we're going to consider today, but before we do that we need to think briefly about why do we want to punish? Ainsworth in 1999 noted that punishment may serve a number of different purposes from a psychological point of view. For those affected by crime, punishment may lead to satisfaction. Knowing that the culprit is suffering in some way may make those affected feel like they have their proverbial pound of flesh. Here punishment is retributive. It's as close as we can legally get to getting even with the perpetrator. Others view punishment as a way to reduce the level of crime. Now this can either occur through deterrence, either of the individual themselves or like-minded others. And the idea here is somewhat simplistic and based on behaviourist principles. And it is that if someone is punished for a certain behaviour, then that behaviour should be less likely to occur again in the future. An alternative view is that punishment may lead the offender to see the error of their ways and actually reform them. And this is the idea of punishment as an aid to rehabilitation. So what does imprisonment actually do to an individual? Well, as I've already said, as a form of punishment, imprisonment is as extreme as we get in Australia. Depending on the crime that the person is being found guilty of, there are many other non-custodial punishment options. But what are those who end up in prison? What will it do to them? Well, at the outset, it is pretty logical to suggest that there is unlikely to be a uniform response to prison. The effects will vary as a function of aspects of the individual, for example, whether it's their first time inside, their age, their gender and their ethnicity, and also features of the prison, for example, overcrowding. In an analysis of US national data by Huey McNulty in 2005, they found that overcrowding was a critical feature of prison environments that dramatically raises the risk of suicide in prison. They found that the probability of suicide increases dramatically as overcrowding increases, and this was particularly marked for minimum security prisons. But what does the literature say about the broad response to being incarcerated? This question was first considered by sociologists in the post-Second World War period. The accepted view is that entry to prison is typically a period of high stress. So, for example, an Australian government report into the health of prisoners in 2012 found that 31% of male prison entrants and 51% of female prison entrants demonstrate a very high level of psychological distress. This compares to the population norms of around 9% of men and 13% of women who typically report a very high level of psychological distress. This distress of those in prison is primarily caused by incarceration. However, this period of high stress was initially thought to be followed by a process of enculturation into the norms of the prison. However, the sociologists working in the post-Second World War period, considering the effect of imprisonment on the individual, suggested that the impact was actually more severe, 
this wasn't just a case of getting used to prison. So the first major critiques of imprisonment and its effects were best summarised by Barton in 1966, who stated that the detrimental effects of institutions such as prisons could be summarised as institutional neurosis. This is a disease characterised by apathy, lack of initiative, loss of interest more marked in things and events not immediately personal or present, submissiveness and sometimes no expression of feelings of resentment at harsh or unfair orders. There is also a lack of interest in the future and an apparent inability to make practical plans for it. A deterioration in personal habits, toilets and standards generally, a loss of individuality and a resigned acceptance that things will go on as they are, unchangingly, inevitably and indefinitely. As noted by Liebling and Marano in 2013, several reports at the time noted that this dependency on the institution created a worrying trend, whereby prisoners, once institutionalised, felt that prison was the only place they could successfully live. So prison wasn't deterring or rehabilitative, but rather comforting and securing, and as such a place that prisoners, once released, wanted to return to. It was perhaps the only place in which they understood how to act and be accepted. So, from this literature then, prisons as institutions were portrayed as powerful, dangerous and damaging to the individuals. They were institutions that served to destroy the essence of the individual and their self. So, Gallo and Ruggiero, 1991, referred to prisons as factories for the manufacture of psychosocial handicaps that prisoners respond to with either aggression or depression. Despite this desolate view of prisons and their impact that emerged in the 1960s, by the 1970s, the studies that had led to this view were subject to a severe methodological critique. In addition, there were accusations of an ideological bias and selectivity. The critique suggested that the so-called pains of imprisonment were largely unsubstantiated, and that in order to work out what impact prisons truly had on individuals, more carefully designed psychological research was required. So this research was done, and as an illustration of this, let's consider one analysis by Bolton and colleagues on the psychological correlates of long-term imprisonment, which was published in the British Journal of Criminology in 1976. So in this study, they obtained longitudinal data from a sample of 119 British prisoners who'd been sentenced to 10 years or more. The prisoners were divided into four groups that were age-matched, and they all had the mean age of approximately 34 years. But between the groups, the mean length of total imprisonment varied from 2.49 years in Group 1 to 11.64 years in Group 4. Now, the aim of dividing up in this way was to see if there were any periods in which psychological changes were more likely to occur. They also had a control group of 30 men who were age matched but who were not in prison. Now, all these men were assessed using many different tests of intelligence and abilities, personality, memory and attitudes. These tests were administered at the start of the study to 215 long-term prisoners and then again to those prisoners that remained approximately 19 months later. Most of those who didn't undergo the tests at time two had been released or were indisposed and so couldn't complete the time two testing. Now curiously, they found few statistically significant differences between the control participants and the prisoners. And where those differences were found, those differences were not in the direction that you might expect. So, for example, the prison sample as a whole shows significantly greater improvement in full-scale and verbal IQ and a verbal subtest than the comparison sample. Prisoners also achieved reductions in hostility over time, which left their scores on these measures significantly different to the control group at the time two testing. In addition, the cross-sectional analysis of emotional maturity showed improvement with increasing length of imprisonment. These results led the authors to conclude, and this was consistent with many other papers at the time, the results of the longitudinal analysis offer little support for the idea that long-term imprisonment is associated with psychological deterioration as assessed by a large battery of psychometric tests. Intelligence remains intact and hostility declines over the test-retest period. These results suggest that imprisonment itself may sometimes be associated with beneficial effects that are rarely, if ever, discussed. So the conclusions of the bulk of the research undertaken in the 1970s and 1980s was that prisoners actually cope surprisingly well. So while initially disoriented and experiencing anxiety about family or friends, long term, at least on the measures being used to assess them, these prisoners seemed to suffer no harm. And they could, after a period of restlessness on release, resettle okay.
So this led to prison being characterised as little more than a period of deep freeze. That is, prison was seen as simply putting a person's pre-existing propensities on hold until they are able to exercise those propensities again. So as Liebling, Moran and Note, this suggests that in the context of prisons, nothing much matters. You can do what you like to prisoners and no long-term harm will result. So how do these results go together? How did the sociologists of the 1960s come to believe in the destruction of the psyche by prison, and yet the psychologists of the 1970s and early 1980s could find no measurable harm? In the 1980s, psychological studies of the effect of imprisonment started to include measures of the concept of coping. The inclusion of this concept led to a more complex view of the effects of imprisonment emerging. So, for example, prisoners who made suicide attempts were found to differ in significant ways from other prisoners. They were showing poorer coping strategies and they were suffering from a greater degree of background disadvantage. Prison was far more difficult for these prisoners, unable to find their ways into jobs, activities and social networks in prisons. Imprisonment seemed to be most distressing for vulnerable groups, so the young or the psychiatrically ill, for example, who were least able to cope with the demands made by the prison environment. And there are a lot of psychiatrically ill people in prison, despite many attempts to prevent this occurring. Whether that illness is imported, that is brought into the prison, or develops as a function of incarceration. And some studies have found a link between effective coping and well-being. Gillone, Jones and Cummins in 2000 considered the psychological well-being of 81 sentenced male prisoners who were aged 18 to 73 years of age and who had served between one month and eight years four months with an average of 1.73 years. Just over half of the sample had spent 12 months or less in prison and their sentence lengths ranged from one month to 22 years with a mean of 5.31 years. They were recruited from a prison in Melbourne and there was a response rate of 26.2% of all those prisoners available on each day of questionnaire administration. Now in a cross-sectional study they assessed the inmates' anxiety, depression, self-esteem and coping styles with the aim of determining the subjective quality of life of prisoners in comparison to the general population. In this study they assessed problem-focused coping, that is to act directly on the situation, Emotion-focused coping, that is to control the emotions generated by the situation, and avoidance coping. They noted, in line with Lazarus and Folkman, that the different coping styles were not inherently good or bad. Rather, their effectiveness depends on a large degree to the situation you find yourself in. So in terms of general population normative standards, they found that the prison sample scored considerably lower than a normative student sample aged 20 to 34 years. The prison sample's depression mean fell within the mild to moderate range of depressive symptomology and 38% of the sample, so a significant proportion, scored within the category of being moderately to severely depressed at the time they were assessed. In addition, in comparison to a standardised sample of American workers, the prison sample reported high levels of both state and trait anxiety and their subjective quality of life level averaged at below those of the mean of the general population. But the coping styles of prisoners were found to be significantly associated with their psychological well-being. So the authors ran a series of regression analyses to see which of the coping styles significantly predicted self-esteem, depression, state anxiety, trait anxiety and subjective quality of life. So the coping strategies of problem-focused, emotional-focused and avoidance coping explain 7% of the variance in subjective quality of life, 26% of the variance in depression, 27% of the variance in self-esteem, 32% of the variance in state anxiety, and 62% of trait anxiety. Of the three coping styles, emotion-focused coping emerged the most important, particularly for trait anxiety, depression, and self-esteem. Here the association was negative for self-esteem, so more emotion-focused coping led to less self-esteem, but positive for depression and trait anxiety. However, avoidance coping was also significant for both state and trait anxiety and subjective quality of life. They found that a higher level of avoidance focused coping behaviour, that is where you turn away from and avoid the thing that is stressing you, rather than confronting it or dealing with it, was predictive of higher well-being. Now this suggests that in a prison setting where many factors are outside a prisoner's control, avoidance oriented coping is beneficial to well-being, as an approach to actually control the situation would be impossible. Interestingly, these authors also found few differences in well-being dependent on the time spent in prison or length of sentence. 
However, rather than interpreting this to mean that no change meant no adverse effects of imprisonment, they suggested an alternative. That is, that they, like others, had simply assessed too late. They suggested the possibility that the well-being of prisoners deteriorates well before the beginning of their actual prison term, so when they're actually charged or remanded. And this critique of methodology is a legitimate one. Just as the psychologists of the 1970s and 1980s criticised the approach taken to the question on the impact of imprisonment by the sociologists of the 1960s, so significant questions have been raised more recently about the studies of the 1970s and 1980s that showed little harm. Hayes and Sparks in 1990 note that the measurement of harm is poor. As Liebling and Morana state, suicide does not require a permanent drop in measurable psychological constructs such as IQ. The pains of imprisonment can be a harm that psychological scales have so far failed to reflect. So where are we at now? So now it is widely accepted that prisons do harm. But quite what this harm is, and whether it is actually what we intend by sending someone to prison, is still being debated. The British Home Office in 1991, in their white paper, Custody, Care and Justice, summarised the impact of prison as, prison breaks up families. It's hard for prisoners to retain or subsequently secure law-abiding jobs. Imprisonment can lessen people's sense of responsibility for actions and reduce their self-respect, both of which are fundamental to law-abiding citizenship. Some, often the young and less experienced, acquire in prisons a wider knowledge of criminal activity. Imprisonment is costly for the individual, for the prisoner's family and for the community. So the dimensions of harm from imprisonment are many and extend, as they always have, outside the prison walls. Accepting the individual and institutional variation that I've referred to, prison is now acknowledged to potentially impact on both the physical and mental health of the person incarcerated. Gore and colleagues working in Scottish prisons notes the increasing risk of HIV infection through the random share of injecting equipment. In addition, an analysis of Australian prisoners by Croft and colleagues in 1995 showed increasing rates of hepatitis B and C in prison, particularly amongst injecting drug users. Vesco and colleagues in 2008 found that injecting drug users in Australian prisons were 24 times more likely to have hepatitis C than prisoners who were not injecting drug users, and at least eight times more likely to contract the virus while in prison than non-injecting drug users. A 2012 Australian Institute of Health and Welfare report showed that needle sharing is more common in prison, with 7% of prisoners who were discharged reporting that they had shared needles while in prison. Croft and colleagues also found that injecting drug use is more common among female prisoners, and exposure to hepatitis B and hepatitis C also more frequent amongst this population. And this isn't just a case of drug users ending up in prison. In the UK inspectorate reports of the mid-1990s, they condemned a number of prisons for turning shoplifters into addicts, with drug use beginning in custody. Now, in some jurisdictions, this is now being addressed through policies and procedures to decrease drug use. Now, in terms of psychological adjustment to imprisonment, researchers also note that some prisoners demonstrate symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Some prisoners develop high levels of anxiety, disturbed sleep, chronic depression, withdrawal from others, and persistent feelings of being different from others and one's previous self. These prisoners are also restless, irritable, have difficulty maintaining or restoring close relationships, they show avoidance behaviour, diminish interest or participation in activities, loss of motivation and a restricted range of affect. There can also be physical symptoms, increased physiological arousal, outbursts of anger, difficulties in concentration and hypervigilance. And these symptoms can be considered an enduring personality change that will cause problems from the prisoner from there on in. Prison also impacts on the prisoner's family. This is an emerging area of research, but logical conclusions on the potential damage, particularly to younger children, when one or both parents is incarcerated can be drawn. Shaw in 1987 referred to this as institutional child abuse. But what do we actually want the effect of imprisonment to be? I think that most would agree that we want it to prevent reoffending. So is this a positive effect of imprisonment? Well, the data is not that supportive. Most research draws on Robert Sampson and John Laub's age-graded theory of informal social control, which suggests that the social bond, specifically employment and marriage, may inhibit offending. Their longitudinal research on offending over the life course suggests that the experience of imprisonment reduces the opportunities to achieve the social bonds that may inhibit offending. That is, those in prison cannot gain relational and economic stability, and this therefore increases their risk of reoffending.
And this relationship cannot be explained by individual differences. Rather, the individual runs the risk of being trapped in a cycle in which crime leads to a failure in conventional activities, which in turn motivates further involvement in crime. There is an interaction between early criminal propensities and societal reaction that influences the adult life chances of delinquent youth. Continuity in criminal behaviour is therefore not solely the result of underlying criminal propensities, but is also caused by societal reaction. So imprisonment actually becomes part of a reinforcing cycle of delinquency and crime. <laughs>